So to those of you who attended our annual general meeting, thank you for staying and welcome to our new arrivals. Thank you very much for joining us. For those of you I haven't met, my name's Amanda Kelly and I'm the CEO of Women's Health Goulburn North East. And I'd like to start our panel discussion this evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands from which we're all attending this evening. These lands and waterways that we live with today are an integral part of the oldest living culture in our world. I pay my respects to our First Nations elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any and all First Nations people that are here this evening. The path to treaty starts with truth telling. And the truth is that colonization has had a profound effect and impact on our First Nations peoples. At Women's Health, we see that for those of us who are not mob, it is our job to listen, to stand back when needed, and to stand up when needed, to make sure the treaty is a reality. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We know that our communities are faced with intersecting crises, gender inequality, social and economic injustice, the climate crisis. All of these crises and more require us to come together to think and to, uh, to think about how we might better work together to imagine and create more equitable communities. Communities that care for the people and the planet. And in doing so, consider the things that make good lives for all. Regions Reimagined is a, is a collaboration between Women's Health Goulburn North East and Australia Remade. It takes the recent work from Australia Remade as its starting point to explore what people want for themselves and their communities. The three conversations in this series are centred on the themes distilled from Australia Remade's wide ranging, um, wide ranging community conversations. These conversations found that overwhelmingly people want care, connection and contribution. In a moment, I'll hand over to Dr Millie Rooney, our moderator for this series of events. She'll introduce our wonderful panellists and together they will launch our series of... Sorry. And together they will launch our series of discussions caring for our communities. You can read Millie's bio on our website, um, so I'm not going to read it out for you. But I would like to introduce Millie by saying that she is one of the most thoughtful, compassionate and strategic thinkers that I have had the pleasure to work with. The work that Millie does at Australia Remade and the research that has emerged reflect Millie's care with people's stories, her willingness to listen and her hope for Australia and our regions. So I would like to hand over to Millie now. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Amanda. And that's such a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, it is my great pleasure to be um, moderating the conversation this evening. I'm just going to hide myself so I don't have to look at my face. Um, and as Amanda said, it's the first in a series of conversations around the idea of care, connection and contribution. And this did come out of some work where we asked people around the country, well, what do you want for you and your communities? What really matters? And people, you know, initially said, well, we want homes to live in, jobs, education, healthcare, access to nature and access to the internet. But then they said, what is most important to us is that we can care and be cared for, to connect with people and to place and to contribute locally and nationally. Um, and it was really fantastic because the Women's Health Network, Goulburn Northeast and other networks participated in this work. So it's been lovely to keep that relationship going. So what would it look like to put care, connection and contribution at the centre of our decision making? As Amanda said, we're starting tonight with care. And with that in mind, I want to acknowledge that I'm here on the lands of the Muanina people in Lutruwida, Tasmania. Um, Kunanya, the mountain, is behind me. And as I understand it, it's a story, there's a lot of stories about water coming from the mountain. Um, there's been a lot of water coming from that mountain recently. It's quite extraordinary. Um, so I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and I also acknowledge that ongoing and deep care for land, culture, community, place 
um, and acknowledging that for many First Nations people across the world, it's been a really difficult time recently. There's been a lot of stuff going on with the changes in the monarchy and what that has brought up. Um, and I, I just wanted to say, well, when we're thinking about care in this context, how deep care requires not just sympathy, but actual action and a commitment to structural change. And I'm really hoping tonight that part of the conversation tonight expands how we think about care and what that, what that means in all sorts of different contexts. So we're really lucky to have um, three wonderful panellists tonight. And I'm so stoked because you were all our first choices and it never happens that the ones we won't turn up. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce the three of them and then we'll have a bit of a discussion and there will be time for questions. So feel free to pop questions as we go in the chat. The wonderful Lauren is going to be collecting those questions for us um, to ask at the end. Um, so please just do keep that chat going. Um, so our first, first panellist is Beth Thornber, um, born in Korowa, a small town on the banks of the Murray River in New South Wales. She's a First Nations artist of the Wiradjuri people, and she's currently actually based down in Nipalona, Hobart, where I am, which is great because we can have coffee. Um, her multidisciplinary practice employs a visual alphabet of animal, plant and human motifs to question themes of impact historical, environmental and human impact in post-colonial Australia. Um, and her paintings consider existing structures cemented in everyday life. Um, and she applies this lens to reimagine ideas of sacredness, boundaries, common ownership and shared responsibility. Um, and I encourage you to have a look at some of Beth's artwork online. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, our second uh, panelist is Dr. Anna Greta Hunter. Um, Anna Greta is a physician and cardiologist concerned with the effects of climate change on human health. Um, she's based in Canberra but has very strong ties to Stanley and the region, so you might see her around in the coffee shops there. Uh, Anna Greta is the Human Futures Fellow at the College of Health and Medicine at the ANU. Um, she's also a senior lecturer in the medical school and the chair of the Commission for Human Futures. Um, and a member of the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. So she's got a few things on there. <laughs> um, she also co-hosts the Policy Pod Forum um, and is interested in that intersection of health policy, public policy and impact of the environment um, on health. And then Matt Grogan is a commercial and property lawyer an owner of Halliday Solicitors, uh, which is based in Beechworth and Yakandanda. Uh, Matt has a passion for addressing global issues on a local scale. He's a director and founder of community energy company Indigo Power, a founder of Totally Renewable Yak and Danda, and a director of Bank WAW. I didn't know if I was supposed to say Bank WA or WAW, so we'll go both. Um, and he lives on a small farm with his partner and two children where he enjoys growing vegetables to eat and sell. Um, so I have one request before we begin, and that is that if you do, if you're willing to keep your videos on, that's really helpful for the panelists. Um, it's helpful for me to see your reactions. Um, Zoom is a bit, I don't know, blank Zoom face is a thing, right? <laughs> we all do it. So like, use your expressions, wiggle your eyebrows, wave your hands, move your mouths, um, and give us a bit of feedback. That's my first request for care. That's the act of care you can do for us as we do this. So as you can see, we have a lovely panel and um, quite a mix of things. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to having this discussion with the three of you. So Beth, I wanted to begin with you. Um, you're an artist and you focus on sacredness, boundaries, common ownership and shared responsibility. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and how it relates to the idea of care? So what, what does care mean to you and why is it important? Yeah, thank you. I, firstly, I'd just like to thank you all for inviting me here this evening and um, just acknowledge the Marina people that I'm also uh, zooming in from La Trueta to tonight. Um, and I'm, yeah, thrilled to be here with you and discussing this theme. Um, I was thinking about, um, obviously, when I was invited about care and what it means for me as a, as a practicing First Nations um, artist and, and woman. Um, and it took me back to uh, early memories um, growing up in Korowa. I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with that little town. It's um, on the banks of the Murray River. And that's where I spent um, a lot of my childhood, um, to be honest, all of the cousins, um, aunties and uncles and my grandparents. Um, and my pop was, and my nan, um, she was a better fisherman than my pop actually. Um, and that's, that's where we spent our time growing up. And in terms of care, it was always 
um, there was always this phrase thrown around in our family growing up and it was caring for country. It took me a lot to, it took me a long time to figure out what that really meant um, as a, you know, as a young, as a young woman, what caring for country really means. And my pop always explained it as um, in terms of fishing, that whenever he goes fishing, he always throws back the baby and that's because he's leaving them for the mob down down the river to catch. Um, so there's enough. And um, that was kind of analogy we used in our in our community and our our mob that caring really is is thinking of others and um, and putting community first because we as Wiradjuri mob we feel a responsibility to our community. And I think in a sense we all have a responsibility to community to make sure that there's enough left over and never taking too much. And so in terms of my practice as, as a visual artist, I was always, that always kind of sat in the back of my mind about never taking too much from land and country and, um, and making sure there's enough down the river for mm. everyone else or enough for our neighbours down the road. And um, I think that sort of, is one small practice that I keep coming back to in my own work, particularly in terms of um, the boundaries that we set as people and how we connect with others and with our community, that um, there is a shared responsibility to care is more than just an inward practice, I think, and it, there is a responsibility to others um, to be looking out for them. And um, I... I guess um, growing up in a regional community as well as um, as a person of minority, really, um, it was really important that we cared for one another as family and as mob um, and that there was a protection there too so that we then have more to give to others too. So that sort of, um, as you know, as a as a really young little girl on the banks of the Murray, just that small phrase is something I, I always think back to. Mm -hmm. And caring for country has kind of become a catchphrase now and people throw it around a lot. Um, but I think at its core, it really is when we care for country, it, it's caring for everyone and because we're leaving something for others to pick up um, and we're giving it an opportunity for um for our environment to give back to us if we if we leave it enough. I really love that um, idea of you know throwing the babies back because I think we often think of it as oh well we do that so there's more for us tomorrow but you've added in that bit of it's actually for the folks down the river it's it's not just for us. Um, yeah that's a lovely way of thinking about that and I, I love your um, mention of boundaries, which I want to come back to in a little bit. So I'll, I'll go to Anna Greta and Matt and then I'll, I'll bring it all, all in together there. Um, Anna Greta, you're, you, I mean, you, you also have seen some of your artwork. Um, you know, you haven't advertised that, but, you know, you're a creative person. Um, but you're also a cardiologist and as a medical professional, you really fit into that kind of stereotype of caring profession. Um, so you do, you do care work. Um, and you're also passionate about policy and climate change. Can you also talk a little bit about what care means to you and how it's relevant to your medical work, but how that actually goes into the other spheres? Yeah, no, Millie, thanks so much for inviting me to be part of tonight's panel. It's amazing to be here. And I should start by, like to start by acknowledging that I'm on Ngunnawal land. I'm in Canberra tonight and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, recognise unceded land. And I, I'm so uh, uh, so glad that Beth started off by that framing that you offered us, the stories of, uh, of living and spending time um, on country and spending time uh, in nature and the effect that that has on, on understanding that relationship. Uh, I learn a lot from listening to people describing their, their childhood and also their experience in terms of that cultural connection. So really great place to start. I mean, care is pretty central, I suppose, to the work that I do as a healthcare professional. And um, that I think it's got to be the primary remit in, in the work that I do as a cardiologist is caring for people. And that can involve all sorts of different things of, of simply listening to stories or trying to help to sort out symptoms that are impacting on quality of life or life expectancy. Millie, you and I have been talking a lot about climate change over the last couple of years. And we've also spent time talking about 
uh, a really light-hearted topic for Thursday night, but catastrophic risks and the sorts of things that really do play a big impact on our lives. And in the last couple of years through the Australian and the global context, we've dealt with sequential climate disasters. We, we are watching another one unfold. Um, and we've also experienced a global pandemic uh, with an infectious disease that impacts on our lives. We see other sorts of challenges emerge or bubbling away in, on the periphery and sometimes coming starkly into view. Questions around things like nuclear war or uh, the geopolitical um, conflict that we, we probably didn't want to imagine five years ago, but is probably much more apparent. Along with economic distress and uh, financial insecurity, um, which is again, a global problem. All of that impacts, I see, on the health and well-being of the people that I look after. And so I, I, I've had the, the great opportunity to spend time thinking about this intersection between health and public policy, public policy areas like housing, like education, things like how we, how we contend and combat issues of climate change, how we learn to care for the planet that we live on and the environment that, that we need to survive. And it does strike me uh, over the last couple of years that using care as a value framework really deeply informs not just the work that I do professionally in looking after patients, but it's, it's an extraordinary element to bring to any complex problem, um, even not complex problems, straightforward problems. You know, it, it should be the defining element uh, that gives us guidance when we're trying to work out, well, what to do about the cost of living, what to, how to contend with inflation, what to do about housing. It's a deeply useful tool. It's, I think it's the primary tool that we can use when we're thinking about climate change and we're thinking about how to contend and particularly with adaptation with the increasing risk of extreme weather events. It's caring for, for ourselves, for our community and caring for the land around us, which is a survival technique. And it's a survival technique not, that's not just practically useful, but it's emotionally fulfilling. Um, and so it informs a lot of the, the areas that I'm interested in, both in the healthcare work that I do and in the policy intersection. Yeah, thanks. Again, it's it's so nice to sort of hear the, the way that, um, yeah, care can, care can pop out in different ways and can be a thread for things. I think we want to come back to that as too. But Matt, I'll go to you so we can hear what you have to say before we bring it together. Um, so... It's interesting when we were talking about bringing a conversation together about care, it was really important for us um, that we just didn't just have a panel of women <laughs> because we so often see care as, you know, women's work. Um, so, and, and the patriarchy doesn't often allow men to talk about care in meaningful ways. Um, and you're also a lawyer, which is another kind of box that often uh, doesn't, isn't allowed to talk about care or isn't seen as necessarily caring. Um, that's a major stereotype. But what does it mean for you, you know, as a, as a lawyer and in the work that you do, you do lots of different types of work to care. What does care mean for you in, in your world? Yeah, thanks, Millie. And um, thanks for having me along. Uh, I also want to pay respect to the, um, pay my respects to the traditional owners here in uh, Yakandanda, where I'm at the moment. Um, and, and also say well done on the Australia Remade project, which is um, remarkable, and also um, full power to women's health as well. I, I think you do um, tremendous work and have done for a long time. Um, and thanks for that introduction. It's, it's a bit of a tricky act to follow after Beth and um, Anna and Greta, but I'll have a go. Um, I think for me, when, when, when this topic got raised, the immediate... Um, response that I went to, which is, you know, where I'll go now, was, was the duty, duty of care. So, so, so duty of care that particularly not, not around sort of, you know, negligence or, or, or you know, any, any sort of legal action or whatever. It's more around um, the duty of care that we as lawyers and, and other professionals as well and, and professions have, have for our clients. Um, and that that sort of that sort of obligation that you need to need to care for them in this really sort of um, imposed and structured way. And and, and as a lawyer, um, I guess that means that one one of the except in really you know rare circumstances, that means that you have to act in your client's best interests. Um, and 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 their best interest is a, is a, is a dynamic. It's not a 
it's not a it's a two way street. So it's a it's a bit of advice, but it's also how that re advice is um, responded to. And I guess for me that um, is it, it can be a tension. Um, and 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 also it gives you a real unique insight into an intimate insight into how how people think and how people think interpersonally and 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 then how that sort of translates into what community they want to what you know inherently I think translates into what type of a community um, they want to be involved in and I guess especially you know framing it negatively um, sometimes people want to be want to be mongrels they 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 really want to um you know do 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 bad by people to 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 because they're really either competitive or they're, they're they're for one reason or another you know quite scarred and and they've they've often got a a bit of a um you know bloodless mindset and I guess that that I guess as as someone who doesn't really personally um subscribe to that 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 way of being and, and also want more more than that really cares about regional and, and rural communities and, and and wants them to thrive um that can be that can be attention it's 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 it's, it's, it's i think it's attention that you you know you, you have to live with and, and and the upsides are um uh obviously out for me outweigh that at present um but i guess that 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 is a, i think a, a really interesting starting point from where i um sit and i guess the reason that well you'll probably decide what that's interesting who want to say but um the the reason that um the reason that I find it interesting is it probably gives me um, a little bit of a shot in the arm to, to, to push into, into that community resilience space and, 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 and particularly around climate and, um, and, and, and energy around, um, you know, we can, we can, we do care there's, and, 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 you know, all these people here tonight care and, and, and there's a whole lot of others that, that really care about their communities. And it's not, it's not just that sort of really reductionist positional um, view that you've got to, you, you, you're obliged to practice in as a lawyer. Um, there's this sort of care meaning, um, you know, confidence and, and, and safety to fail as well. Like giving, giving yourself permission that we do care because, um, uh, we do care. We do, we do want things to be better, and 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 therefore we're going to sort of make it okay um, to to fail and have a go at things. Yeah, that's such. I love that idea of care means safety to fail. I think that's a that's a really lovely phrase um, to hold on to. And I think Matt, when you and I were talking prior to this, one of the things that I think you were saying to me was that. Um, you do your job as a lawyer and there can be some people who want you to be a bit of an attack dog kind of lawyer potentially, um, but you see your duty of care as recognising that you live in a small community and so the work that you do is not just about, you know, getting the most for this person who wants you to be the attack dog, but actually recognising there are ripple effects to anything like that in your community. That is that that's sort of what you've been saying. Yeah, that that's right. It's sort of like... Um... You know your interpretation of of of, of, of this of the sphere or the prism of that that duty of care and, and what that person want, wants and and trying within your sort of obligation trying to interpret what what the word the words are that are coming out of their mouth and and what you think they're they're meaning and 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 reading between those lines um, as to you know what it could mean and what the possibilities are. Um, and that's you know that that can be a bit of a bit of a nice edge, and sometimes it's not not appropriate to to put the community first. But sometimes you know just just gently around the edges, um, you can do that. Not only because you know it's not about me particularly, you know that I'll have to walk down the street and pass the person that I wrote the letter to, um, but but it's it's also about knowing that in the long run that person will as well, and sort of having seen the cycle of you know, of this over a while now, um, that often that those feelings um, don't last for that person and, 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 and also um, finding a space or building a space, I guess, to gently sort of allow people to recognise that. Mm. I think it's been interesting that in the conversations I've had with Beth, Beth, Matt and Anna Greta, one of the themes that has really come up or came up for me a lot was the idea of 
going beyond like expanding our boundaries of care and Beth when we were talking I don't know if you'd like to talk more about this um, but you were speaking you were saying your art explores these boundaries and you said to me something about it's interesting that we can drive down the road and on the one side there'll be a national park and on the other side there won't and on one side of the fence we care and on the other side we don't and I'd love you to talk a bit more about that um, and then open it up Matt and Ina Greta to please jump in around this idea of boundaries and care yeah yeah sure I um I had this realization I had never really thought about um, national parks and segregating one piece of land um, as opposed to the other piece of land, which is all connected, um, and why why we um, why we designate some parts of country to be special and to be recognised and protected, and um, and so I you know I've been painting a lot about that, so I've been using that to fuel my creative practice, exploring um, the flora and fauna that lives in these um, national parks, which is. Um, a very um, Western method of dividing country again. Um, but I, I came across this because I was on a trip with my brother out to my my pop's country and we were driving it in uh, out central Western New South Wales. So it's it's flat and red and, and very dead, <laughs> um, but it's beautiful country. And I just came across this sign that said, we're now at a national park. and. And it just got me thinking about the boundaries that we put on land management and resources. But I guess in um, in terms of care, we often set our own boundaries subconsciously as well in the relationships we have with others. And again, I think that's a very westernized way. Sometimes we are so hesitant to show that care outside of our immediate familial connections and those people that we live with. Um, our parents and siblings, and um, and it got me thinking about um, the First Nations way of kinship groups and community, where that care structure exists well beyond those in your immediate household. In fact, you have aunties and elders from many mobs and um, many different countries that there is a responsibility to show care, and in turn. Um, the reward to that is that you are looked after as a member of that community and you're in that care circle. And it's um, it's a really beautiful relationship and it, it strengthens um, your support networks. You feel supported because you have that just outside of the people living under the same roof as you. Um, and I was sort of, I, I don't have the answer, but I was thinking about how we can um, change these parameters and these boundaries we put around care that, it's um it's not necessarily prying or or um or being a sticky beak if we do um inquire about others and and ask if there's ways that we can show care towards them or if they need a helping hand um it does help us to feel you know um less isolated and segregated in this time that we live where it's um you know we have huge mental health crises and people that do mm -hmm. feel um, separated from a community but if there was a way for us to um, to adopt this First Nations way of kinship and community groups that um, do exist outside our home I think um, yeah people could potentially feel a lot more supported and connected to the people that they live around um, and I guess yeah I try to think about the ways that my painting practice can impact my relationships and my life with others and um, as a curator as well, I am directly responsible to the community I work with. So if I'm not showing that care, I, I can't expect anything back from the artists and the elders that I work with. So it's integral to um, to not only my personal safety and um, comfort, but also to um, my work as a curator and as, as an artist. Mm. Can I, I might interrupt uh, and uh, that's such a powerful model I think and, and it reminds me uh, yet again of, of how important it is to listen to First Nations knowledge um, and how much we can learn from reframing and having having so much of our so many of our assumptions challenged 
And a, a really practical example of community engagement for me, I've, I've got a place just out of Beechworth in Stanley and we've got lots of trees in the garden. And we, we bought the place a couple of years ago um, and uh, that we knew, knew a couple of the locals. Um, we had a storm come through uh, one afternoon and a couple of trees came down in the garden, including one right in front of the house we couldn't get in and out. It didn't nearly kill me, but it sort of nearly killed me. It was one of those near-death experiences. But what really struck me is that we didn't have a chainsaw. Um, and so we're, you know, we're trying to get out the door and there's this big uh, limb just out the front of the, the house. Um, and so I'm out there with a handsaw trying very hard to hack away at it. And it was about 20 minutes before a neighbour turned up with a chainsaw you know, and, and made it possible for us to get in and out of the door. Um, and then a week or two back, I live in Canberra most of the time and I was out on one of the walking paths just around the corner from my house and there's a limb down and it's blocking the pathway and you can't get across this little bridge um, that goes over the waterway. And we wait. We wait for our local government services to come to fix that. We don't have a sense of community coming around that. And there'll be legal and risk issues around that. But I was really struck by the contrast in response that in, in communities where we are engaged and where we're caring for each other, and I think in regional communities particularly, we are often aware of who our neighbours are because we're aware of potential risks, things like fire particularly, I think really do bring communities to understand the local landscape of who's around them. Um, but we don't have that in the cities anywhere near as well. And uh, for me, when I'm thinking about climate change adaptation and I'm trying to think about how to, how to reduce the impacts that we'll see both from a mental health perspective and a physical health perspective, it's, it's how our communities respond and care for each other. So breaking down some of the physical barriers and also recognising that there are mental barriers, there are crazy barriers that we've got um, that prevent us from being able to help people when they're in need. And, and I think that's why the, the caring principle is so important in, in a lot of the work that I'm doing. Mm. Do you have anything you want to add in there, Matt? No, I think there are two um, amazing um, reflections. Um, have you got a chainsaw yet, Art and Greta? So I've got it. Well, I've got a chainsaw. Actually, my chainsaw that I had in Beechworth, I had in Yarralumla, but I didn't use it here. Because oh, yeah, okay. I thought I'll just get out there if if the government Do doesn't it. come. Do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, that, but but I just wanted to um, the the comments that um, Beth made about kinship. Um, I mean, very powerful. Um, and 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 to me, that the word there really is, you know, um, trust. Like the, the the relationship between caring for someone and and trusting someone, and and I think expanding that definition of of what it means to care for someone and, and someone in your community, and and I guess um, I've got an interesting. Um, I can see Rowan O'Hagan in the audience here, who's a fellow director of Indigo Power and also a living legend. So, hi, Rowan. <laughs> um, this this is about Indigo Power. Um, when we started up to the renewable yak and dander, and Lawrence Lathy was also in the audience, and she was one of the founding members of that. Um, totally renewable yak and dander had this amazing run of success in a really small community, um, like punched well above its weight in terms of projects delivered, and still does, um, and, and and uptake of, of renewable assets, and and is a real you know thought leader, but also a technology leader in, in terms of, you know, what the electricity grid looks like for the next, you know, 200 years rather than the last 100, um, and which is really exciting. And, and if you were to ask me what the key reason for that um, success is and, and was, it's around, it's around trust. It's around the trust that's been built and, and continues to be developed and attended to between the people that started up try or totally renewable yuck and down and the people that sort of worked on the idea and the rest of the community. And then that trust um, was sort of exchanged, if you like, between the community and, and, and the community all being on board and um, and other partners that, you know, had no real right to, to deal with a, a, a town of 2,000 people and 1,000 houses, but, you know, multinational companies and, you know, electricity grid owners and several universities and federal government and state government, all, I think, built um, from trust. And the contrast, I guess, um, is out of out of Totally Renewable Yak and Yander, we, we built a company called, um, called Indigo Power, which was to commercial, and is, um, to commercialise um, 
some of the um, ideas and, and particularly around electricity retail. So Indigo Powers and Electricity Retail. And it's been really interesting um, that what we probably took for granted in Yakandanda around that trust piece sometimes has been a struggle, not always. Um, and, and, and Indigo Powers, you know, doing some amazing work as well and, and, and has got a great team. But some of the barriers um, that it faces around sort of perception and trust and um, and, and 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 you know brand, I think it, it's it's quite interesting for me to contrast um, the two. And I just wonder whether that you know that that notion of of kinship and broader community has something to do with that. You know how how it operates. Mm. I think there's something really interesting in there around, um, yeah, that that trust and the, that permission to fail. I think you said, or the safety to fail, Beth. I think you said, and that that trust that enables, um, you know, if I fail, you'll pick me up. It's not the bureaucracy that'll you know push me down. It's we can do that together. You know, I didn't have a chainsaw, so you know, it's a small <laughs> bit of failure that someone else could um, not say you failed under credit, but you know, like those, <laughs> those moments. Um, do you? Uh, one of the things we've been really interested in in Australia Remade is, you know, we have infrastructure for care and, and that might be, you know, hospitals or it might be, you know, the people who come and fix you when your tree has fallen down, the whoever it is in Canberra who goes to, to fix it. <laughs> um, what, and Beth, you talked about those relationships of care being really important and those ideas of kinship that goes beyond that Western system. We've also been thinking about, well, what is the other type of infrastructure that isn't just the hospital or the chainsaw, but is maybe it's time to meet people, maybe it's a facilitated space for trust. I'd be really interested in your thoughts, um, all three of you, about uh, what would a reimagined infrastructure of care look like? Mm -hmm. And maybe another way of asking that is like, what, would, what needs to be in place to enable you to do your care work in all of its forms better or more? I can just keep talking. So I th the first thing that comes to my mind is one, giving people permission that this is something that many of us, and this is the work that you've done, Millie, is that confirms what we know, which is that we want care in our lives. We want to be able to provide care, and that can be care for people, uh, community, friends, family, neighbours, and it can be care for the natural environment and the places that we live. We want that in our life. We want to be cared for. We want to be part of something uh, that makes us very human. And so just starting by articulating and giving people permission to make that a priority is so profound, absolutely profound. But I'm really struck that we should talk about time and we don't prioritise time for care. Um, it's, you know, if we talk a little bit about economics, it's not in our standard um, uh, way of measuring whether our economy is working very well. Most care work is unpaid or under-recognised and it's not part of the standard metrics. We look to see whether we've been a successful economy or a successful government or not. And so I do think there's something very powerful in recognising uh, that that is a framework that can be shifted. We can choose to recognise the importance of care. We can choose to measure the importance of care. And we can choose to prioritise time for caring. And that means giving time for people to care for themselves, spending some time sitting on top of a hill, looking at a view, sitting still, reflecting on what's been going on, giving people time to do some exercise and to organise their life and to process the things that are going on. But also that that caring time for our community and for our places. Mm -hmm. um, and how powerful that would be. And so releasing our imagination to, to just imagine a world where, where imagine if we in our towns and in our cities and in our communities, we were all given time. You know, I give everybody one day a week um, to, to do care work, whether it's for yourself or for the place around you. And how, just how powerful that would be in terms of, I, I think in terms of happiness and well-being. And, and I think for both of those things, there'd be a, a fairly strong argument to say that those those indices would improve if we need to measure things. Um, the health impacts of, of making a decision like that to prioritise time and to prioritise caring are significant. You know, we it's not just mental health and well-being; it's physical health issues, heart disease, diabetes, um, contending with other ill health and uh, and. Other challenges. The net benefit to our community is immense. 
So th these are not rigid structures. The, the choice particularly to use things like GDP as an economic metric that we somehow need to work towards, we can challenge this. We really can challenge this. And we can choose as a community to prioritise care and to prioritise the time for care. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Beth, you, I can see you nodding away there. Do you want to add something in? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a bit of a revelation, the gift of time as a resource of care. Um, we obviously live in, um, we live very structured lives and we, we wake up and we go to work and we come home. Um, and the idea of giving people time in their day to practice their own form of care, whichever that may be for that individual. And I think it, it needs to be a very individualized approach. You know, there needs to be consultation with the various communities that we engage with as to what care really means for them, because it's so different, obviously, for everyone. Um, but the gift of time um, to be able to explore that themselves, um, I mean, I, I think our our whole world would change, wouldn't it? Um, um, and also, you know, space as well to, pra to, to practice as well to, to, I think, outside space, um, spaces for people to gather is so important. Um, just, um, you know, a, a calming and peaceful spot for people to take a break um, and to, with, with no obligation um, to be earning money or, or counting time um, is, would, you know, would revolutionise our communities, obviously. Um, and, and yeah, I think um, that idea of trust as well is that I, trust is, um, is really a proven track record of care. And so when we continuously show that we care, that's when, that's when trust really builds and that's when stronger relationships form between one another. Um, and, yeah, allowing... Um, <clears throat> allowing um, these conversations to happen and that trust to build is where we can start to form these models of care with each other. I think um, that link there between Ina Greta's point as well about how we measure, you know, what we measure success as. And in some work I was doing years ago, one of the things that was really clear was that those sort of um, I was thinking of the soft edges of community where it's a little bit ambiguous, where there's a little bit of obligation, but there's a chance to learn to trust each other, which is quite different to, you know, going to the shop where you buy something, you hand over the $2 for whatever it is, you buy what you buy, um, and that ends the relationship. It's a very clean cut relationship, but these sort of blurrier time to to build trust with that give and take, I think is really important. Um, Matt, before I go to you, I'm just going to encourage everyone, I can see a little bit in the chat, but if people are thinking about, oh, actually what it would take for me to care, like what would it take for you to care and be cared for? What infrastructure do you need right now? Like I'd love that to just go in the chat because I think it's important we start practice thinking about this. Um, Matt. Yeah, um, it's a good question, um, Millie, and I think um, both of the other panellists have hit some um, important points. Um, and I'll, I'll um, first to admit that sometimes my self-care isn't necessarily that good. So it's sort of like, um, these are some ideas um, maybe I should read to myself. Um, the, the, the probably, the, the, but the one, you know, beyond, beyond, it's not about me, beyond me, um, it gets it like, this really gets at the whole rat race model, doesn't it? Like, and, 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 and um, the rat race model and, and that all our role models, politicians, business people, successful people are, are, are successful in the rat race. That's, that's where they're successful. So the things that you sort of throw out of that, or that, that, that sort of throws up for me to how to challenge that and what, what infrastructure we need to challenge that. Um, one, you know, one, one is this sort of the social wage, isn't it? So that's like, you know, if you want to choose to get off the rat, rat race, then it's then it's safe to do so. Um, that's that's a big one. Um, but I think the the equally important one in terms of how you how you break that cycle and 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 sort of what what jolt that you need to to um, enable such sort of bold policy thinking is we I think we just need to celebrate um, and, and enable infrastructure and and and, and capacity to celebrate celebrate non non-conformists and 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 non-conformity and 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 that that it's okay to sort of you know which is you know what your 
project's all about, about Millie, which is why it's so cool. Like, it's okay not to, you know, want to have the McMansion and the whatever because, of the, you know, you don't want the mortgage or, or, or whatever it is that you want to um, resist um, or, or not be a part of. It's almost like if you've got the care and the sort of safety around you, having the courage to, um, to not conform around, around some of those, some of those ideas that don't enable us to, 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 to generate and, and sustain communities that care. Mm. Do you think, um, this is to all of you, do you think that uh, to actually enact an infrastructure of care um, does require courage? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, without a doubt, it's sort of like the, one of the, if you, were, if you were selecting your toolbox, that'd be one of the first, um, one of the first tools, isn't it? For me, anyway. Beth or Anna Greta? Yeah, I think courage is really important and, and particularly challenging norms that we've all grown up with. 40 hour week, GDP is growth. You know, we have to, you have to have a profession and you have to do all this work. Um, that it's it's courageous to challenge that, but it also the, our failure to challenge these ideas comes at a cost, mm-hmm. um, and so it's it's also I think recognizing the harm that we do by by not acknowledging the central importance of care, and time and family and connection, the the value of of uh, our, the relationship between us as people and the land that we live on. The sorts of ideas that that I only understand uh, insufficiently, but that are so richly informed by by listening to First Nations voices. Um, if we fail to address these issues of of how we care for ourselves and how we care for the planet that we live on, um, it's counterproductive. It's destructive. It leads to our our personal ill health, the ill health of our community, and the ill health of the planet that we're on. Um, so, so the brave thing is also the necessary thing, I think, in this space. Mm. Beth? Yeah, I was thinking about um, the lifespan of care. And so as babies and children, we're cared for. And then as adults, we run the rat race of everyday life and the expectations of society to have a career and to have a mortgage and, um, and to overconsume. And then as we get old, we then need to be cared for um, in a health system that's um, quickly failing and struggling to keep up. Um, But if we were able to change our parameters and boundaries around care and started implementing our time and and changing our structure of our day even to practice this throughout our life as adults, then we would be living healthier and longer lives. and I think um, again that comes back to the comes back to the way that I've always been raised is that you make like it's a priority, it's a responsibility to make time for care, and that is that is time with others and sharing and then being cared for. Um, yeah, I see people bringing up the four day work week in the chat. I'm all for the four day work week. <laughs> uh, in fact, I I choose to only work part-time and um, I mean I have my creative practice on the side which ends up being full-time anyway but um, for me that is a really strong form of care um, and I prioritize that um, because if if I'm not able to to practice my own work then I'm not able to give back um, to others and then and then I'm not successful as a curator or as a First Nations arts worker I can't be an advocate or champion others if I'm not making that a priority in the practice in my own life. And I think that's it's true for all of us. Mm. Before we open for questions, I've, I've probably got one more for you all, and that's kind of playing off what you were saying there a bit, Beth, about, you know, we're born and we're cared for, then we go into the rat race and then we're cared for again. Um, kind of wanting to think about the way care is so often thought about in binaries, like we're either cared for or we're caring for, you know, I'm a carer or I'm being cared for. 
the same way that we often see it as, you know, women are the carers. I had a guy who once said to me, I love the work that you're doing, Millie, but I couldn't possibly talk about it publicly because it's it's care and that's not really serious. And I thought that's a really, that was a really gendered moment there of, of I could care, but he couldn't. I mean, and that's even just considering, you know, a binary gender there. Um, so I love your thoughts, all three of you on um, how do we think about care in a way that isn't really binary across a few different areas? Yeah, th that's a really important question, um, Amelia. And all, all I can really probably throw out there um, to this is again, attention. Um, for, this is sort of personally now, um, you know, we've got two little tackers at home, two little boys who may or may not be watching if they are, hello. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, it's, 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 it's every day you sort of, you, 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 for me anyway, at this stage of life, grappling with that tension, all, all you want to do is stay home and play or, you know, go for bushwalks or, you know, grow food in the garden. And then you've got this, so, so you've sort of got to just weigh up that long term, that short term desire with the, with the long game, which is, you know, well, stability and, um, you know, all those other things and, and, and beyond, beyond just the, the immediate um, family that, that there is a community as well that you can contribute to. So that I don't, I don't have any answers to that question, um, but I, all I can say that it's it's a live, extremely live tension for me. Yeah, there's nothing binary in those tensions there for you, really. <laughs> it's, it's a complex system. Yeah. Beth, Anna Greta. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I don't have an answer for this either. I think it's. Um, I think it's the way we've been made to believe that our structure should exist and that our relationship should be is that um, women take on the nurturing maternal caring role and that men so much haven't been doing that but um, I'm it's very exciting to see that starting to be challenged um, and I think I, I do believe that change is happening at while at a slow pace um, you know I think that's where that whole community aspect of care is so important. Is that um, it's yeah taking away um, the the gendered roles that we have and being confident to communicate and speak with others and um, and that yeah care shouldn't be gendered. It's not just the women's role at all. Um, and in fact, um, it's you know it's obviously so important that we're all um, we're all taking our own responsibility for this and um, yeah I don't I don't really know the answer to that question I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any it's of us do <laughs> it is a really tough one and I guess the one of the things um, so you know in all of our lives it's complicated balancing the the work and life stuff um, but I, I do think being able to recognise that some of this is a political choice, it's a policy choice. We, we, it's not written in stone that we work a 40-hour week. It's not written in stone that you have to um, succeed in some way. It's not written in stone that some people are entitled to make more money than others. These are political choices that we make when we vote for people and when we participate in a democracy, and these are things that we can actively discuss it also strikes me that we we tend to we believe and we, we're often told this. You know, if you think about when the newspaper comes out on budget day in October, you know, the newspaper spread will be winners and losers. So we we're we're, we're often told that these choices will will be binary. They'll have people where they're, they're going to good good thing, and uh, there will be some cost. It can be much better than that. So you know, reducing the working week, and there's been some discussion in the chat about a four day week. There's a lot of work on 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 that improving productivity and improving um, well being. Similarly, universal basic income showing benefits both from a health perspective and also from productivity and people engaging in meaningful work that's enjoyable. Um, it doesn't have to be a win-lose binary. And, and again, I think we've been, we've been sucked into that belief and I think we can challenge it. I think we can actually make these choices in a way where 
everybody gets some benefit. There might be differences in the benefit or everyone loses a little bit and there'll be some difference in who loses. But but we need to challenge that binary framework, I think. Um, and it helps us to see the opportunities that are presented by by making some of these structural changes. Mm. Well, that's, that's a lovely way, Anna Greta, for my final question for you all before we open it up, <clears throat> is that if each of you... Um, could make sort of one one change what would your if you were reimagining your region to be a region that centered care what would you do it's a small question <laughs> <laughs> so I, we, we do this to people on our podcast occasionally you know one one small change that you want to fix a really big complicated problem and it's a it's a nightmare question yeah um and i'm going to use the answer that i use occasionally when when people ask me this question which is just simply as a value statement now, when we make choices about a new road, when we make choices about changes to infrastructure, when we make choices about schooling, about education, about how we how we interact in our communities, that that using a, a value of uh, a, the, the value caring framework, that using making sure that care as a narrative is central in the discussion, that it has as much resonance and as much space as any of the other metrics that we might choose to use. Um, that, that we can reframe all of the decisions that flow on from that by, by, by explicitly recognising the value of caring for, mm. for place and for community and for people. Yeah. So that's, that's a great challenge for everyone tomorrow. How many times can you get the word value caring into your day? Like maybe come back and give us a list. <laughs> It's a hashtag, so so yeah. yeah or at least that's one that, that I use occasionally, along with a friend of mine. So yeah, yeah, yeah. count them up tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> Matt, for me, um, oh, firstly, I, those points that Anna Greta made about the previous question, um, they were really insightful. I think, um, and and it made me reflect on legal practice again and how often the the binary, like oh, you know, like the zero sum game, I win, you lose is um not even what people want um because um and, and anecdotally as well it's uh, often they're not happy with that result anyway even if they win because they've been in a relationship with this person um so that, that was that was the first thing i had to jump in on mm -hmm. in terms of the one change i'm not sure maybe i'll regret this later on when i'm lying in bed because i'll think of something better but um uh i think it might be the social wage i think i think it might be like a a, a proper like we're in we're in we're in a we're in a country that's you know incredibly it's got its issues um and 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 serious issues but um it's 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 i believe got the capacity to 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 afford people a, um a, a a living wage like a, 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 the, 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 there's no question that if you're if you're if you're in this country you get enough to survive um and I just would love to see what what gets shaken out of that in in terms of you know um, localization of of, of 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 global issues like food and um, and you know anything um, te telecommunications and um, and energy and, and and all these all these big problems people would have the if if they were so inclined um, would have the capacity um, to. To, to join with their community and, and, and the right people and, and, and try things and really push the envelope. And it's, it's been proven, I think, time and again in, in regions where that happens politically, um, through the Voices for um, stuff, you know, through food and, and through energy and through, through other movements, um, especially in regional Australia and, um, where, the, where the stakes are so high, but also the opportunities are so great. I just reckon if you took that equation of being chained, chained to the wheel, um, to put food on the table out of it. Sorry, if you not took the equation out of it, took that piece out of the equation. Um, maybe that'd be the one to, to answer your question. That 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 sort of to me, that's the start of the care infrastructure that comes mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. And don't worry, we won't hold you to it being your top one. It's just one idea. Um, Beth, do you have any final things you want to say before we open it up and potentially answering that question too? Yeah, I guess. Um similar to um, Matt's comments, I, I, I take it back to what I said at the beginning. I think if we all threw one little fish back, thinking about those down the river, our neighbours down the road, 
there'd be much more of an equalizing where people could afford to care and um and to be shown care as well so um yeah never taking too much just taking what we need sometimes leaves enough for others to have that ability to um to be cared for and to um to develop their own models of care in their lives as well if we're all um showing more to each other and yeah not taking more than what we need mm. well that's lovely we've now got um how many times can you get value caring into a sentence tomorrow um check out maybe some regional things around where there's been successful you know basic wages and read up on that and you know harangue some politicians about that potential and then beth that lovely one of throw a fish back um, I think there's a really, you've said some lovely phrases tonight around the fish. <laughs> it been really <laughs> big stick in my mind. River girl. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do have time for questions. So, Lauren, I don't know if you've been keeping track of questions. I've been keeping track of questions and also beautiful comments and conversation that's that's been happening in the chat. So I might start with a few questions and then I'm going to try and persuade one of the commentators to actually rephrase what they've talked about into a question because there's some nice stuff there. But right. um, Trisha Hazelegger has a question here, which I think is well directed towards Beth. Um, Trisha says that hearing about First Nations kinship care really opens up her thinking about care. And at Women's Health, we're very aware of the gendered impacts of care. For example, the invisible elements of women's paid and unpaid care work, especially in mm. relation to climate change and disasters and the challenge of masculine stereotypes to men's caring roles. And Trisha wonders whether First Nations kinship network experiences can help to actually reshape some of these gendered parameters, Beth, and maybe others. Yeah, great question. Um, my experience with kinship group and community is that it's not gendered at all, actually. It's a very different model to the one that we've been structured to observe um, in Western culture. Um, you know, it's... Um, it's a whole mob of people. There's there's no gender really considered. In fact, it's it's very much what we can learn from our elders, but our elders are also there to pass on knowledge and care for our little ones too. So always learning from younger people too. They're the next generation. But um, you know, we we're constantly being cared for and caring for aunties and uncles and um, elders, little ones. Um, and yeah, I, it's one of the few places where I find that um, gender doesn't really come into the equation. Actually, it's the round table, um, and um, and women speak up um, and have such strong and empowering roles in um, mob and community, um, just as much as anyone else. Um, yeah, that's been that's been my experience, and I think that's why um, I'd be so interested to see if we can learn from the First Nations ways of kinship and community and our care practices, because um, we just we just have not we've not been taught to think about it in that way. We're so bound by our structures of what care should be um, that we sometimes are, have not thought about looking outside that, or or maybe don't have the courage to as well yeah or don't know how to perhaps is is another yeah. element to that I think mm. and I think Anna Greta's point about you know even just starting to talk about it might be a way in there Beth I don't know if you agree with that but at least kind of raising it to the conscious rather than just assuming that this is how we have to do things because that's what we're taught yeah absolutely I think it, it always starts with um raising a question and having the conversation first um and that's I don't think it's happening yet it's not happening with in schools or in our community groups um I think you know for our young ones going to school it'd be amazing if we were having these conversations about care and what young ones think care is mm -hmm. um as little people gender doesn't rarely comes into it it's, it's caring for each other as humans um and I think our, we've been persuaded and, um, you know, conditioned to um, 
to that sort of changes as we grow older that we sort of think these are the roles we need to slot into um but it, it doesn't really need to be that way at all mm-hmm. i think I we think- come back again to the time and courage to do things differently yeah, I was just going to say that segues very nicely into a question from Sue Marrera, um, which is that given one of the big barriers to a real care culture is money, and I, th- I guess that's something that we learn to prioritise as adults, having been conditioned by this culture that we grow from as little people, um, which then feeds into the ineffective prioritising of time, how do we make practical change? to all panellists, perhaps. I'm happy to give that. So we've got to recognise that we, we own, like, what we measure, that we decide what we measure. This is a political choice. It's a political choice. It's a policy choice. We choose to measure and um, prioritise uh, gross domestic product, which is generally related to the extraction of resources or the consumption of stuff. Um, so extractions of, of either natural resources or, or human capital and then the constru- consumption of stuff. Um, that's a choice. And so, so the power is in having a conversation about, about the way the economic metrics that we use. And um, there's a tremendous amount of work that's done in feminist economic theory, which I only cursorily understand. I don't at all. Um, I'm not trying to be expert in this at all. I'm not. Um, but but we choose not to not to put uh, care as a metric into that equation. We we can we can ask this of our system. Um, we have the potential as a community to start to do that. And you see that there are examples around the world of, of on small community or on regional basis of people making making changes toward well-being economic frameworks, which account for the natural environment and the social dynamic of the sorts of policy choices that are made. Um, I, I really think that, that make that recognizing that we can we can challenge the system that we're in at the moment and that it can change, um, and that it might already be changing. We've got a, a government now that at least is looking at well-being as a metric, um, and so that conversation is beginning again as voices as communities. Um, we can we can encourage that conversation along. There's great work done in the field. If we started to measure, why does it matter? Because of what you were saying, which is that we make decisions on the basis of economics. We make a lot of decisions on the basis of economics because economics influences crazy things like whether we can live in a house, whether we can pay our bills, whether we can provide food and and adequate uh, housing, the the essential elements of life that Millie's report comes up with of the access to healthcare and access to accommodation, access to, to secure housing. Um, and so we need an economic system in, this, in the world that we're in at the moment. Um, but we can we can change the metrics that we use to value our care. We can begin to count caring. We can we can make it economically valuable. And I think if we make it economically valuable, it starts to contend with some of the issues around gender as well. So th- these are choices, and I would so love I'd love as many of us as possible to be brave in having the conversation about about how how we make those choices on a policy basis. Yeah, that's such a good reminder. These are political choices. These are policy choices. Yeah, I always think it. So I, I do a podcast with Sharon Bessel, who's a children's poverty expert. And one in six children in Australia live in poverty. Um, one in six children live in Australia, in Australia live in income poverty. Um, we have more than enough resources to go around. These are political choices that we make. Um, and I think we can do a bit better. I think we can do a lot better. (laughs) Well, a lot better, absolutely. Um, Matt or Beth, do you want to have a a response to that question? Yeah. um, The the I mean, again, Anna Greta's um, made some great points. I think that I'll I'll maybe riff on it a little bit differently. This one that the time and having the time is is an interesting um, proposition for me, particularly around around climate because we don't have time right like that's that's the um so i've i've i and and some of the people that i sort of work with um have a strong sense of now's the moment you know like that and 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 probably put a lot of um probably wrongly put a lot of other things to the side um but it's it's a bit some of that urgency um plays into how how you know you can go about other parts of of care and the, and the 
and I guess the effort um, that, that can sometimes be involved with that. So I don't, again, it's more tension rather than answers, um, but it's around, I think for me, um, if, 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 if we're to think about policies and if we're to think about, you know, reimagining what they are, um, there needs to be a recognition, or in my view, um, it would be good if there's a recognition in that conversation around the urgency of that that particular issue, the urgency of action, the urgency of drastic and 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 sort of you know monumental um, change. And I feel like again, this is this is pro this phrase is probably be becoming a little bit cliche now, but not not making sure that we don't forget the lessons of COVID. Um, in that um and, and 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 harnessing that urgency that we that we all shared um it's the it's the cliff edge theory isn't it when we're right on the cliff edge we do pretty well especially if a bit of a wind comes up and you know um is, is threatening to blow us off we'll, we'll jump back a few meters but um the cliff the cliff is sort of crumbling isn't it with with climate change so i i reckon that the urgency around that and the strength um, and keeping in mind of the opportunities that we have. I've totally just morphed the question, Lauren, uh, <laughs> to where I wanted like to Like a go. good panellist. I, I could be on Q&A, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, that's what comes to mind when, 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 when we speak about time and the time for care, we've also, I think, got to have the, the awareness and discipline to, to realise that on some issues there is no time or there's, there's, there's no time to waste anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always think, how do we do urgent work slowly? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't have an answer for that. But I think it's a really important, um, yeah, important issue that you raise. And I think there's also interesting things. Um, Beth, I don't know if you want to jump in here. I've, I've sort of forgotten the original question, but stuff around money, it takes money to care. Uh, and I think going back to the courage conversation that we were talking about, it's also taking control back and saying we don't always need money to care. We need money, you know, we need money because it allows us to house ourselves to access um, particular types of healthcare or, you know, money buys us access to some types of care, but we don't uh, always need money. Money's not necessarily the tool and there are other ways to care. And I think that's an interesting thing about thinking about courage and some of the models you've been talking about, Matt. Um, in the local Yak and Dander community that there are, you know, time can also access care. Um, so I just think that was raised a few things for me there again about how do we, how do we, how are we intentional in the language that we're using about what is and isn't possible? Um, Beth? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't want to be naive in the sense that sometimes care is money um, and that's, that can be unfortunate at times, but um, and time is money as well, and that's one of the ways that we show care is by giving of our time. Mm -hmm. um, but our resources are not always monetary either, um, and I think that's important. Is that we all have a we all have a plethora of resources that are not always consumable and are not always um, at a physical monetary cost. And I guess it's exploring. Um, and being self-aware of the things that we can offer to others that um, doesn't come at a physical cost, that the resources we all have. And we, if we take the time to um, think more inwardly and actually put a responsibility on ourselves to realise that we do all have a resource of some sort that we can offer to others and show as a way of caring, then, um, then I truly think it does come back. Um, and the more that we give out, I mean, th there is a whole social move movement of self-care and we, we all have, are aware of this in its various forms, I'm sure. But I think sometimes we get, um, we can get caught up in, in, in the, in the nuances of, of self-care. But I think um, if we really reflect on what we all have as individuals and the resources we have in a community of people, we're all offering even something small um, whatever that may be, it it does have a greater impact than what we realise if everyone's having a go. Um, and it doesn't, yeah, I think like you were saying, Millie, it doesn't have to doesn't have to be a um, something that's quantifiable, you know, in terms of money. Um, it can be um, it can be our it can be a conversation, it can be our time, 
um, yeah, be many different things. And I think part of that is recognising that we do have those resources that can be put to use to change the policy decisions, as Anna Greta was talking about. Mm. There's both the individual and the way that those that individual capacities can link mm. together for that sort of and our inter- yeah, change. and our individual positions and privileges um, that we don't always are not always aware of is something that other people don't have, and so we can use that in a way that does give back um, the privilege of going. To school and having an education is something that even in this country a lot of children do not have um, you know that's a way that we can take note of that um, there are people there that would appreciate you know our care in that way um, Lauren are there any more that, yeah there is another question, and I, I feel like this might be a good one for you to start off with, maybe, Millie, because you asked the panellists and the audience to consider whether enacting an infrastructure of care required courage. And Sarah, who's one of the Women's Health staff members, actually followed that up with a few questions of her own, and there was a little conversation in the chat. Um, and I wonder whether this is something that you covered in some of your Australia Remade conversations with community. Um, whether the requirement of courage implies that we hold a fear of committing to care as individuals and as community. Are we fearful and of what? Or what, were people that you spoke to fearful and of what? Why do we cu- require courage? And are we alone and so fearful of non-conformity? Those sorts that of is things. such a good question. I want everyone to have a crack at that. I... I don't, courage didn't come up in that context in the work that we did. Um, But I think in other work that I have done, there has been that, like, to be cared for is to be vulnerable and is to be sort of indebted. So my husband has a chronic illness. We're often calling on our community to support us in all sorts of ways, from meals landing on the doorstep to, you know, outside events because of COVID. And it's so easy to feel indebted and I'm not, I should be giving, not receiving. We're we're a very generous country in wanting to give a lot. And I think we find it very hard to receive, um, certainly in the Western culture. Um, And so I think from previous work that I've done, that courage to receive and that recognition, that receiving of care is a gift to your community because it creates community bonds that build the trust to enable us to do all those things Beck was talking about. So for me, I think there is a real in the work I've done in a few projects over the last few years, there's a real yearning to care and be cared for and a fear of being seen as a burden and obliged. And so I always used to say to people, the biggest thing you can do is like receive. (laughs) And it's so weird. It goes against everything we think about, you know, Um, but I'd I'd love to hear from Beth and Matt and Anna Greta there. That that's a really interesting, that's a fantastic um, question. Um, I mean, they all have been, but that that that's really thought provoking, um, and and that's a that's a good insight there as well, Millie. I'll probably um, go back a little bit to what I was saying earlier around um, that safety to fail stuff. So, like mm-hmm. that fear in terms of committing, that the committing um, component to that question was a really thought provoking um, part of it, and and it's about what's on the other side of that commitment. You know, so, so say I commit and say that, you know, that's going to have consequences over this side of where I am and how I'm living at the moment. What does that look like? And a little bit of, that, of that's going to be the, um, the unknown, like there's inherently an element of unknown. But I just think there's, there's, a, there's a big part of that that's cultural and that, that, that cultural um, community cultural, but also in a, in a broader context of, of that it is okay um, to fail I and mean, it, it, it is it's okay to have a go at things that you you don't you firmly believe in and and with some conviction and you know ideally backed up by data and 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 and, and supporters that, it, that it's okay to try some things try try new projects and for them not to work um or for only components of them um to work and i think that that in terms of you can apply that to i think anything in terms of change and in terms of like a a journey towards um, the type of world that we want to, you know, leave for our children. But, but I think in particularly the the theme of tonight, um, and 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 a, and a, you know, an ecosystem of care and and caring and all the things that come out of that. Um, to me, it's about 
um, it's almost up to everyone else, isn't it? Like it's, it's up to, and, and, it, and I think that actually lines up really well with that receiving, the component that you were talking about, um, Millie, because the, re, the receiver is on the other side. And if, if the jump is, if there's some safety or some known safety or some a track record of safety on the other side of the commitment, um, then we can give it a go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with your sentiments, Millie, that if we, I guess um, there's a hesitancy to receive care sometimes. Um, it puts us in a vulnerable position. Um, but if we don't place ourselves in these um, circumstances or positions to be cared for, then we're less likely to be able to care for others when we do have the means. And on the flip side of that, if we are in positions to show care to others or generosity, um, but we refrain or refuse to because of whatever reasons, societal reasons or the way we've grown up, um, personal history, cultural background, then um, sometimes we're less likely to receive that care when we really need it. Mm. So um, it's, yeah, sometimes it can be really challenging to um, accept that at times throughout our life and depending on circumstances, we all do need care of some form and it's okay to take that and to um, sometimes it's okay to take that at that moment with no um Resources to resources to give back straight away or immediately. We don't all, we don't all have that means, but I think it's important that when we do find the means or we do have that resource, whether it's monetary or not, or if it's a gift of speech, um, that if, when we do give back, the cycle continues. Um, and if not for anyone else's benefit, but for our own mental health and benefit, it's important. Yeah, I think that's a real reminder. And in the work that we did, the act of caring and being cared for, both of those were really important to well-being. Yeah. Yeah, it feels good to yeah. care for others and to be cared for. Yeah. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, I'm just, I've, I was struck, I was having a conversation this afternoon um, with a, a patient of mine and her daughter and they were talking about the distress that she's now in residential care and, um for people who've read the Royal Commission into Aged Care, you know that in the Australian context, in a well-resourced environment, a place where we're a rich country, um, we've really chosen not to prioritise care and we've put people in all sorts of situations into, into places where care is not the priority and care is not provided, even when it's so badly needed. Um, and so I'm just going to come back to calling it out. And Millie, you're so right. That, uh, that this idea of being able to receive care um, is as important as being able to give care and prioritising that is centrally important um, and it affects all of our lives at some point in time, um, both the need to receive care and, and the capacity to, get to, to be caring. Um, we know that that's one of the best things we can do for our own mental health and wellbeing and particularly through periods of adversity. So the prioritisation of care um, it, it needs to be in the conversation. It's how many times can we use the hashtag value caring in a sentence or in a day? Yep. Thank you. And I don't know if there are more questions, but I think we are going to have to wrap it up. Um, it's been, thank you so much, Beth and Matt and Ina Greta. And, and everyone, I'm going to go and have a look at the save chat because I can see there's gems coming through there. But I think it's been really interesting. I think we've danced a little bit between some of that individual care, you know, on a personal level, give, you know, throw our personal fish back, um, receive care, as well as that idea of, well, it is a policy decision. We do our actions, you know, Matt, you talked about, um, you know, you might work with a client, but actually the way you work with that client has ripple effects that you're aware of in a community and you're thinking of that as well. So is it kind of from all of these individual um, right up to sort of how we operate as a society. And I think there's been um, a few key things that have come for me that I, I'm going to think about. Um, and that idea of um, the safety to fail. Um, I think, Beth, you said trust is a proven track record of care. And I think perhaps trust is also a proven track record to receive care. Um, 
the idea that, um, you know, let's see how many times we can get value caring into a conversation tomorrow because words are important and talking about care is a powerful tool and a strategic tool. Maybe that needs, requires courage for some of you. Maybe it doesn't require courage, but it can be a bit weird. It's a bit like talking about love in a policy context. Sometimes you get a raised eyebrow, but it's powerful. Um, the idea of time has been really strong tonight, I think. Um, time to care and be cared for and, and time to kind of calm down to do that urgent work. Um, as so the four-day work week. Um, yeah, and that idea of throwing one fish back, um, not just for ourselves, but because it has impact for those downstream from us, um, whether that's future generations or literally down the stream. I think that's another really powerful thing. Um, and so before I hand back to you, Amanda, I just want to say how wonderful it is to work with Women's Health Goulburn Northeast. It's a long name to say, which I always have to like trip over, but it was amazing when we started working with you. Um, so the, the, this group was the Women's Health Goulburn Northeast was one of the conversations we had about the public good. And I just walked away from that like, oh, there's this amazing organisation full of like incredibly bright, perceptive people doing work that really actually has impact on the ground and interfaces with policy. And so I was like finding this little gold mine of, of greatness. So it's been such a pleasure to keep working with you and to have these conversations. So thank you to Amanda and everyone else. And thanks so much, Beth and Matt and Anna Greta. I'm, I'm so glad we have you in the world. <laughs> Thanks, Millie. You're an amazing host. It was great talking with you as always. And yeah, wonderful to speak with Matt and Beth tonight. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. It's been great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Millie. And um, yeah, Beth, Anna Greta and Matt, just wonderful. And I think Millie just said, um, I've got a few ideas. I've got millions of them now. It's like, pull, pull, pull. my brain's just going everywhere. Um, so I'm going to have to relook at this and, and listen and write more notes. I just, you know, it was like, I wanted started writing notes and then went, I can't because I'm missing the conversation. Um, so thank you so much. Um, it's just been a real pleasure. Uh, to listen to you and to engage and, and to just hear your thoughts around these, this really important piece of work. And Millie, thank you so much for, um, for um, uh, moderating so beautifully. Um, and uh, Lauren, also, thank you for, for bringing those questions together from, uh, from the audience. And um, Thank you so much, everybody, for really engaging in this topic. There were some great questions, some great chat in there. Um, and, you know, just to bring it back to the, what you were talking about, Millie, um, we walked away from that initial engagement with you going so feeling so good and so empowered in our work and saying, you know, with awesome ideas and um, we were so excited when the when your research came out and we're going this is this is the work this is this is primary prevention in a piece of work um, you know in a document that says this is what we do it's imagining the future that we want it looks at the social determinants of health and it says this is what how we want to live um, so thank you for that wonderful work thank you to our panelists and thank you everyone for being part of this amazing conversation um, it's just lovely um, we'll be uh, editing this and popping it on our website for you to look and, and everyone who's registered will be sending you out a link um, Please do, if you weren't at the um, AGM, we've got our annual report out and um, which talks about our work. If you're interested to find out more about it, we'd love you to. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping and ask our, our current board members to stay online, please, because um, our work is not done. <laughs> going. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so we've got uh, we've got another 15 or 20 minutes of work to do tonight, and then we can relax. And hopefully, no one's brain has it actually exploded, so we can actually have our board meeting. So thank you, everybody. Have a lovely rest of the evening. It's been great to have you. Thanks so much, thank Amanda. You. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.